joining us for <laughs> okay let me start again there we go um well thank you all for joining us this morning there we are yay full screen um my name is todd hager i'm the industry chair of the emerging technology community of interest and i'm joined by my uh fellow co-chair uh neil chaudry and we are very proud to be working with the acquisition community of interest to put on this joint event. Uh, it's a, our second Shark Tank competition. We had one many moons ago uh, in, with blockchain at uh, NASA and this one virtual. We're thrilled to be able to put this on for all of you again today. So let's jump in and give you a sense of what we're gonna be doing today. Uh, first of all, what we wanna do is make sure that, that you got, that, uh, we introduce all the folks that are going to be involved. We've got uh, an esteemed group of judges here that we want uh, you to uh, get to meet, go through those pitches, and then uh, announce some winners. You're going to actually hear the winners today as, as uh, uh, before the close of this entire event. So as I mentioned before, uh, Neil and I lead the Emerging Technology Community of Interest, and uh, we've been uh, working together for a bit now, and, and there are, we do all of our work, as many of you know, through the working groups. Uh, we have a, a monthly meeting that is the third Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Uh, for, uh, for the entire emerging technology community of interest. But we, as I mentioned, do all that work in those working groups where they meet oftentimes weekly, blockchain, AI, intelligent automation, DevOps, and IoT. Uh, with a lot of great material available for folks out there to playbooks and primers and things to help folks understand how this technology is uh, used in government and how best to take advantage of that technology within your own agencies. So we are uh, uh, made up of a great leadership team and we've got a couple of open positions uh, and we can talk about those offline, but uh, we encourage you to come join us. And uh, we're thrilled that you're here today to be able to see one of the things that uh, we put on together as uh, a joint COI offering. So without further ado, I want to introduce the chairs of the event. Uh, we have two chairs. First, Mike Rice, co-founder and chief operating officer of Cornerstone IT. He's got 40 years of uh, experience providing IT and program leadership to government, including the support of three presidential transition teams. Mike is also an author of In Pursuit, a business development life cycle. He has his fingerprints on all the working groups that I just mentioned uh, within the emerging tech community of interest, and he's a good friend. Uh, I want to also introduce Jaime Garcia. He's an acquisition manager for the Internal Revenue Service, overseeing, overseeing the procurement innovation branch with more than 20 years in government and industry. He's the government chair of the ACT-IAC acquisition community of interest and an honorary leader in the emerging technology community of interest. He's a veteran of the US Navy and he's also an author and a good friend. So welcome guys and take it away. Thank you. Thanks Todd and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, really excited um, about this great event. So without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce our very esteemed panel of judges, our sharks. Uh, this morning, we do have Polly Hall. Polly serves as the ex executive director of the Department of Homeland Security Procurement Innovation Lab within the Office of Chief Procurement Officer. She also serves as DHS's Acquisition Innovation Advocate. Polly is very instrumental in shaping the strategic direction and collaboration framework of the PIL, which is a virtual lab which provides a safe space to experiment with innovative techniques across the Department of Homeland Security to help modernize and transform the procurement function at DHS. We also have Florence Casale, who's currently the Director of Procurement within the United States Digital Service. She and her team work to modernize and streamline the acquisition process to bring amazing digital services to the American public. Prior to her time with USDS, Florence served as the Head of Acquisitions for the Defense Digital Service. We also have Janelle Billingsley. Janelle is the technical lead at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Consolidated Acquisition Systems. Janelle remains a visionary leader in promoting enterprise acquisition capability solutions. She is a Ph.D., an author, and an excellent CEO, and of course, a results-driven expert. Also on our panel, we have Enrique Magnan who is the awards management lead with the All of Us Research Program at the National Institute of Health, NIH. 
He oversees the portfolio of other transactions supporting the program's efforts to advance individualized healthcare by enrolling over 1 million participants that reflect the diverse populations of the US and developing tools to help researchers analyze participant data. Before joining all of us last spring, he serves as the Chief Acquisition Advisor and Acting Director of Contracts for the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA. Also on our panel this morning is Mr. William Randolph. Will is, uh, I I'm going to do a little bit more for Will uh, simply because he's the founder of Think Acquisition. And if you're not following him on LinkedIn, uh, you are certainly missing out. He's got a tremendous series uh, called Will's Whiteboard, which is a wonderful educational experience for both government and industry. And he also is starting a new podcast uh, with Soraya Correa, who, of course, was the chief procurement officer at the Department of Homeland Security. He's a former SES at DHS, so we're very happy to have him on our panel this morning. And last but not least is Harrison Smith who is the co-director of the Internal Revenue Service Enterprise Digitalization and Case Management Office. In this role, he spearheads IRS efforts to modernize systems, simplify business processes, and empower taxpayers and IRS employees to rapidly resolve issues in simplified digital environments. And prior to this role, Harrison was the Chief Procurement Office, excuse me, the Deputy Chief Procurement Officer at the Internal Revenue Service uh, under the Office of Chief Procurement Officer. And that is our esteemed panel. Very happy to have them this morning. Thank you for joining and back to you, Mike. Thank you, Jaime. Okay, um, I wanna talk a little bit about <clears throat> who's gonna be represented today in, as our contestants. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the evaluation process afterwards and how we got there from here. Um, <clears throat> first we'll be pitching today will be um, civic actions. Um, they'll be, they're we're gonna be um, presenting their rapid ATO um, process and solution. Uh, next, and this is interesting, we open this up for <clears throat> not just industry, but, but agency submissions and academia submissions. So we actually solicited you know, all three uh, areas uh, for, um, for presentation. And here we got an IRS at Summit C. Um, um, they're gonna get their intelligent automation for automated contract mods. Um, Oracle will be representing themselves here, um, looking at blockchain, um, uh, using AI and blockchain and uh, Government Acquisition Solutions for FedRAMP Certified Government Cloud. Uh, OTG Group and Core CLM will be presenting the Accelerated Federal Acquisition using AI and machine learning. And then finally, Summit to See uh, will be doing a waste abuse fraud reporting um, system. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> All right. So I said I was going to tell you a little bit about how this process went, got put together. Um, what we did was we had a kind of a funnel effect um, where um, we had 18 submissions total. And uh, of those 18 submissions, we actually broke them up into, we took out names, we, you know, names were changed to protect the innocent, if you remember that show. Um, the idea is name, names were reviewed and we had a panelist go through um, and look at groups, okay, and score them, okay. Those were brought down to, to create the top five, top 10. Uh, that top 10 was given to a separate group and the separate group um, scored using the same scoring criteria to get it down to the top five and those top five are um, being represented here today. Um, we were looking at seven areas, um, impact, um, that's the greatest impact to uh, acquisition workforce, feasibility, simplicity. We looked at cost effectiveness, um, how data was used, that was important also, um, the scalability of the solution so they can go, go elsewhere, um, and how much security was taken in consideration um, because we live in that world now. So, um, so you're gonna see this is the exact same criteria that the judges are going to be using today. Um, so I just want everybody to know that this is how the process worked to get down to the top five. Um, a little bit of the schedule today, just got to give you a heads up and we'll get started. Um, we will have um, five pitches, as we said, okay? There'll be 15 minutes a piece. There'll be 10 minutes uh, for presentation. This is orals 101. Um, 10 minutes for presentation and five minutes for the judges to um, just for clarification questions. If they hear something that's interesting, they want a little bit more clarification, they will ask those questions. There'll be five minutes that we'll put together for that. Um, I've got a question here. Folks, you have the ability to use your own slides to present, okay? So everybody's got the ability to present. So I just wanna make sure that the, that the contestants understand that. Um, we will get two presentations in. I'm gonna take a 15 minute break, okay? Once we take that 15 minute break, um, we'll come back and pre presentation three, four and five will be, will be given. 
Um, and then we're going to put the judges in their private little room. <laughs> we're going to do a breakout um, for a judges huddle for 20 minutes. Okay. Now during that 20 minutes, you will get a poll because all the audience is going to be able to vote for who they thought was, we kind of call it the old wow award. Okay. Um, so the judges are going to be looking at it from a certain perspective and that's the impact um, to the acquisition uh, world. And then we as audience get a chance to vote also. So there'll be two, two announcements. While the judges are in their huddle and we're, we're actually get done with our poll, um, what we will do is um, we will go through the normal, um, this, is, this is the Emerging Technology COI meeting. So we're gonna go through the normal business. Um, we'll bring the judges back um, and then we'll make our, we'll make our, our, our announcements of who, who won. One would be, you see the, the, the poll from the, the, the audience and then from the judges. Then we're gonna do something which is really kind of, I think this is exciting. This is an opportunity for you. Um, we're gonna have an ask the panelists time, okay? About 25 minutes where we'll put the panelists up. The judges are sharks, okay? And um, you'll be um, putting questions in on the chat. Uh, Jaime and myself will be fielding those questions and I'll be presenting them to the panelists. And this is an opportunity for you to kind of hear. You know, you wanna to talk to the acquisition, the 1102 workforce, especially the leadership team. I mean, we're, we've got some strong leaders in this particular panel. This is your opportunity to, to be educated. So, um, so ask, ask away, ask good questions, and I'm sure you're gonna get some great answers. Um, with that, I think we're done. Um, are we ready to begin, guys? All right, we're ready to begin. So what we're gonna do is you will hear, I'm gonna give you 10 minutes, and I'm using, I'm using some real technology here for timing now, okay? You're gonna hear this. Your 10 minutes are up, okay? And then we'll move into Q&A. And what I will do is I will try to reset that <laughs> so it doesn't keep running. And then once we get done with the Q&A, immediately it'll shut down. Um, the next person will start presentation, next we'll start pre 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 presenting, okay? We good? Awesome, this is exciting. I'm looking forward to it. All right, first up, civic actions. Um, please get, take control of the screen. And um, when you start speaking, I will start timing. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arielle Lebrecht. Uh, I'm just pulling up our slides here. By the way, guys, we've got plenty of time. We, we save a lot of time early on, so we, we'll be able to do these transitions, give you guys time to do the transitions, so, okay? Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Yes. Thank you. See the whole screen. Here we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll start the timer. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. 
Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Arielle Lebrecht. I am the Digital Services Manager for Civic Actions. I am joined today by my colleague, Fen LeBalm, who is our uh, Chief Information Security Officer. And then some of you may also know our Senior Capture Manager, Keith Kawasaki, who is also here. I first wanted to talk a little bit about who we are and uh, what we do. We are a registered small business founded in 2004. We have numerous former US, US digital service leaders distributed amongst our team. We're a founding member of the Digital Services Coalition. We are founders for both technologists for the public good. We're founders of Distributed Gov and we are chief maintainers of DCAN. So that's a little bit about us. So I first wanna talk about uh, the current state of ATO. Today we'll be talking about rapid ATO, but we're going to get to what that actually is in a moment. Uh, so every federal information system must go through NIST risk management framework before it can be used to process federal information. This process culminates in assigned authority to operate being issued. We have found that the current FISMA ATO process is slow to incorporate changes. These can be changes brought on by factors including system or technology changes and upgrades, as well as the constantly evolving threat landscape. It's also a closed process. There's no sharing of information across agencies or even sometimes within agencies, and this causes blockers and delays during the acquisition process. Let's talk a little bit more about the problem. In its current form, as the ATO documentation is being written, technology and risks are changing and evolving in real time. Definitions, processes, and formats change by contract, vendor, division, and agency. And often sometimes, as I mentioned too, within agencies. ATOs in their current form can result in over almost 400 plus pages of non-machine readable documentation. Civic Actions is currently working hand in hand with Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Offices of Information Technology, so OIT, to develop the Rapid ATO. As I state here, Rapid ATO is currently a pilot program that we are looking to uh, expand and to scale. So there are three main phases, all built with US web design system and human-centered design in mind. Phase one uses natural language processing to discover reusable components and to generate a library. Phase two integrates IA to select components relevant to a system. And then phase three uses robotic processing automation to refactor system security plans using quality component narratives. This is currently a pilot program with the goal of becoming a more widely implemented and used mechanism to streamline acquisition. And I'll get to that more in a moment. Let's talk about the benefit. What can ATO, Rapid ATO offer us? Rapid ATO prioritizes time and cost at its core. And this is throughout the acquisition life cycle, start to finish. Our Rapid ATO projects a cost reduction of more than 75% over the total life cycle. One of the main goals of Rapid ATO is to guide end users who do not possess in-depth knowledge of security and compliance. We're developing the Rapid ATO product to be intuitive and easy to use for all stakeholders, regardless of their level of knowledge and comfortability. And as an open source solution, it's easily accessible, flexible, scalable, and built for sustainable ongoing authorization. We find that in our work with CMS currently, that they are ahead of the curve with our rapid ATO pilot. Across agencies, pilots are everywhere, but there's little reusability that's currently open source. We find that rapid ATO is a tide that will raise all boats, leveling the same quality of risk mitigation across different government agencies. So now let's talk about acquisition. We want to emphasize here the time to achieve security compliance. Shifting the security compliance process left will enable mitigation of vulnerabilities and misconfigurations 
early on in the development pipeline. This reduces human error and human burden. Employing RPA, IA, and NLP into the system security plan creation will improve efficiencies during the acquisition process. Again, this goes back to increasing speed and lowering costs without sacrificing security. Let's talk now about our strategy, which includes a federal compliance library. The federal compliance library is made up of reusable components. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about these components. As component creation and discovery, so the state of natural language processing within the library itself matures, the library will grow. In turn, as the component library grows, an array of government partners and agencies will benefit. Selecting components can be completed by inventory analysis. This is using RPA. Verifying components can be done by inventory and technology subject matter ex experts. Composing components into a system security plan will be automated using intelligent automation. And then finally, the system security plan control verification and assessment can be largely automated with RPA. So this is self-sustaining. What's also important to note too is that the library is designed to be distributed and can be expanded across the government and even into the private sector. This is a resource that will support government-wide compliance efforts by offering reusable components and trusted pre-existing sets of various technology stacks being used across multiple agencies concurrently. Let's talk about what the end state looks like. So this suite integrates tools developed by the NIST OSCAL team and collaborators with our own tools, all of which are available from GitHub. The federal compliance library upon which they operate will also be maintained in GitHub. An important part here is the clarity of documentation, which contributes to the ease and navigability. So I wanna emphasize human-centered design and the overall user experience here. While this is still under development, these tools and components will be able to be pulled into many other applications. Let's look at finally values to the acquisition life cycle. For contract planning, best practices are unified and streamlined under Rapid ATO. For the solicitation, it guarantees a standardized level of performance that is also applicable to the QASP or the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan and it sustains knowledge through reusability throughout a transition period or during a transition plan when a new contractor is coming on. During the evaluation phase, agencies and contractors can demonstrate an ability to speed up the process regarding both time and money without sacrificing security. This also means related that increasing security will be looked on more favorably during the acquisition process. Rapid ATO is cost effective, it's faster, it's automatically verified, and it sustains its own longevity through automated updates for ongoing authorization. Finally, let's look at the playbooks that we used. We consulted the Intelligent Automation Playbook, Volume 1, so we talked a little bit about robotic process automation, and we also consulted the Intelligent Automation Primer. That wraps up with my commentary, and I now would like to open the floor to our panelists, and we're looking forward to your questions. You still have 50 seconds left. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have a song? <laughs> Alice, do you have any questions? Sure. Hi, this is Florence. Thank you so much, Ariel, for that presentation. Um, I think we... Many of us are very aware of the problems that exist across the government with the ATO process. And my question is around what, what do you all consider the lift on the acquisition community in order to incorporate this type of um, technology and solution? So I thank you for your question. So I think at the moment, because this is currently, uh, as I mentioned, a pilot for us, and it is something because you know, we, we as a company, we opt for open source for, for free and 
open source software um, to make things accessible, to make things scalable. So our goal is obviously always scalability and ease of use. Uh, the pilot phase, we in the pilot phase currently, we are discovering uh, the, the level of effort for the acquisition side. Um, but our goal is ultimately to have, and this is where I mentioned to um, human centered design and in the overall UX here is, is the ease of use, the navigability and that uh, that rapid ATO is, it is measurable and it's standardized, right? So we're leveling the playing field for, uh, for folks on the acquisition side. And we want to make sure that in running this pilot program and looking at the scalability, that it's going to be equitable for all people involved for, for the acquisition side. I know that that's not so much of an answer of here's the exact amount in terms of level of effort, um, but this is a process of iteration of continuous improvement. And when it comes to security and planning, that we can consistently be providing that higher uh, level of quality. If I may ju jump in just for a moment <clears throat> on that, and also apologies, they're, they're tearing up the street outside, so there may be some noises. Um, uh, as, Mike, as Mike mentioned, security is the world we live in today, and every, every system that you are working in acquisition is going to have security issues involved with it. Um, one of the things during your acquisition process that I would think would be interesting, would be valuable to look at is, is the agency, <clears throat> excuse me, is the agency and or the contractors uh, building the system using a system like Rapid ATO, which will speed the process to production? So this is Harrison, I'm having a slightly more basic question. There's a, a lot of good content and good information. Um, and, and sort of in the, uh, as, uh, as I talk about in, internally with, with our team, what's, what's the dummy Harrison version, right? What's, what's, the, what's the 30 second distillation if you're trying to talk to somebody down the street uh, about, what it, about you know, what the activity, what the proposal is. And then also a, a follow up on, it sounds like you're trying to get machine readable data out of the act activity through OCR and the like, I think, as opposed to ingesting machine readable data at the go, um, trying to figure out if I'm, if I'm misconstruing the, the proposal. Thanks. That's the uh, second one first. Um, uh, you are, that is slightly misconstrued. We're, we're looking at refactoring cur what's currently in Word docs into machine readable code. Um, it's not using OCR, it's using NLP uh, to look for patterns in languages, that, patterns in SSPs that represent components. Components are really the big win here, and components are a major part of the, uh, the uh, Federal Compliance Library. Um, right now, um, well, first of all, what is a component? Uh, NIST, NIST defines a component as, um, I'm reading here, a reusable grouping of control implementation statements that deal with the specific security requirements of a defined technology function or process. Um, for example, uh, if, you're, if your system is going to use a firewall, um, that has to have, uh, it, there'll be controls for that firewall that involve the, the, secu the security, uh, the, the configuration, the access control, the logging the requirements, et cetera. Every single time somebody builds a system with a firewall, with a firewall, even if it's the same firewall, they have to redo that process, and they come up with that over and over again. If there, if uh, and and they and there's wide quality as to how well they do it, um, uh, and how well how well it's verified and assessed. So um, the the what they're what we're building with components is a library where people can. Um, uh, <clears throat> where, where people can uh, generate a good quality component for brand X firewall and just pull that off the shelf and they have they have 90% of what they need right off the right off the bat. I need to interrupt. That's the end of the question and answer time. The timer went off. Um, I want to thank uh, Civic Actions for an incredible um, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, you may have the opportunity to ask some of these questions later during the panelists. 
time, um, but uh, we need to move on. Next up, IRS um, Intelligent Automation for Automating Contract Modifications. You are next up, please. Hey, good morning. I, I'm David Gill, uh, Procurement Data Scientist uh, at, at the Internal Revenue Service. And I'm gonna be presenting with, with my colleague, Jessica Mosley at uh, Summit to Sea Consulting. And uh, what we wanna share with you is um, our use of uh, robotic process automation or bots to help automate modifications to, to government contracts. And this really is a, a labor intensive task um, requires a lot of man hours for the government's 1102 personnel. That's, that's the contracting officers. And one of the drivers um, for the, the number of modifications an agency has to do is, is continuing resolutions. Um, if there's three continuing resolutions over the course of three months, uh, each time, you know, like in that picture, you're gonna be the hairy contracting officer trying to turn out those funding modifications, adding 11.2% or whatever it is of the annual funding to the contract. Um, and you gotta get it out fast because the, the contractors need the money. Um, and the mechanics of doing these modifications, I mean, yes, we have contract writing systems at agencies, but um, there are automation gaps. There are things these systems do not do. Um, so RPA can come in and fill some of those automation gaps and take calculations that would otherwise be, be manual, like this month's continuing resolution is 11.2% of a year or something like that, um, and populate that across a whole portfolio of contracts. Um, the, the second item on this slide, the, the mass modifications, uh, there's a lot of policy-driven mandates that can apply to all contracts across the agency. So currently we're implementing the, uh, the COVID safety executive order, and that requires adding language to um, nearly every single contract at, at an agency. Um, so, so given the volume and the repetitive nature of the task, this is an area where, where automation can really help. Absolutely. Thanks, David, and good morning, everyone. I am honored our submission was selected, and I'm happy to be here. My name is Jessica Mosley, and I work with David Gill at the IRS um, to develop these automations. So continuing resolution, resolutions, as David said, and new regulations really exacerbate an overworked workforce. So with upcoming retirements and the constant concern of budget cuts, the administrative burden is massive. But what if it didn't have to be so hard? RPA can automate incrementally funded mods, streamlining those post-award activities. All you need is a license for a Cox product and you can get started right away. We use UiPath, which was created back in 2005 and implemented by numerous government agencies already to automate that repetitive work. And that's exactly what we want to do to remove this burden from our contracting officers. So with more regulations to follow and more work piled on, we are asked to do more with less. An RPA can step in to handle those repetitive rule-based tasks, allowing those contracting officers to focus on high value work. So to help um, COs process these incremental mods at the IRS, we worked with the OBSA team to create the attended automation. So let's see this in action. This video is about 20 seconds long and just a snippet of what we built for the IRS to process incremental funding modifications. And they call these personal services or PSC mods. So the bot deftly replaces tables with new calculations and modifies predefined data elements, such as deobligated funds, previous obligations, hours processed and the hourly rate. As you saw, the automation is not overly complex. It's simply performing data manipulation. In other words, taking data from Word and Excel and transcribing it to create a new Word document. The automation runs locally and data is retrieved and stored from a shared folder containing Excel and Word documents. No PII data or credentials are used in this iteration and no changes are necessary to any of your underlying systems in order to take advantage. There we go. 
So the team came to us and asked if we could automate their incrementally funded modifications. And there were hundreds to process, about 800 in fact. And each modification took contracting officers 30 minutes. So it's repetitive, time consuming and error prone. CEOs are transcribing data from three documents into a fourth document. And do you remember the image from slide two, the, the worker who is just so stressed looking at their calculator and their screen? Well, contracting officers are moving between screens and tabs and applications, copying and pasting and adding and subtracting. It's exhausting. And using our PA, we can create a new modification using data manipulation. Accurate calculations are made in Excel and tables are easily updated in the template. Not only does it decrease administrative burden, but people like getting paid. Automating contract modifications gets funding to the vendors quickly, and that's something industry and government both want. As we see continuing resolutions persist and policies that are enacted in weeks, RPA is the quick and easy way to tackle other use cases. And there are plenty of repetitive and rule-based processes to go around. CEOs are being asked to do more with less and reducing the administrative burden to process incremental funding and exercise option modifications must decrease. In addition to incrementally funded mods, RPA bots can do things like update clause language and contracts and process contract closeouts. And CEOs are given the ability to do the work we need them to do and not the administrative tedious work bots can relieve them of. The automation I built at the IRS is repeatable and extendable. What do I mean by that? Repeatable because workflows can be reused across robots and processes and extendable because the automation built at the IRS can easily be modified to search for different documents or templates, variables, or create a new report. The current iteration is an attended automation right now, but Summit to see can also transition the bot to unattended, removing human interaction altogether. Creating a PSC modification used to take 30 minutes, and RPA can reduce that time to under three minutes. The potential reduction of administrative burden to contracting officers would be a game changer. The process allowed the IRS to standardize and capture consistent information and new modifications. And for those agencies concerned with PAL, this automation decreases PAL because it gets the contract funding to the vendors quicker, and vendors are happier when they get paid on time. And it's secure. Microsoft Office is well established, and UiPath has been implemented by numerous government agencies already. UiPath encrypts customer data in transit and at rest using TLS or transport layer security. And basically, it's a cryptographic protocol designed to provide those communications securely over a computer network. Most importantly, CEOs can value and focus on high value work. Scalability is a key selling point of RPA. A robotic workforce can be as large or as small as the agency needs it to be. And additional robots can be developed quickly for either no or minimal cost. Workflows can be reused across multiple robots and processes. And it's also important to consider the roadmap for scaling automations. We use an iterative agile approach to go from pitch to prototype to production. We created a robot factory that identifies, curates, builds, tests, train, deploy, and support auto, um, RPA automations. So that provides a means to go from automation ideas to reality and focuses on continued development. And finally, automating contract modifications with the RPA impacts the lives of CEOs, freeing them from a massive administrative bur burden. CEOs are given freedom to do meaningful high value work. Impl implemented with a COTS product, it's using your data from commonly used applications like Excel and Word, cost effective through licensing, scalable and secure. RPA can be used to streamline activities throughout the acquisition lifecycle. In our case, it was for post-award activities, but the use cases don't stop there. Using repeatable workflows makes it possible to deploy in other agencies quickly. And after seeing incrementally funded mod activities reduce 90%, it's a game changer. Are there any questions? That's very good. 20 seconds left, you guys are rocking. Okay, open to the panel. 
Hello, this is uh, William. Uh, I just have a, one, one question. What other use cases outside of incremental funding modifications have you considered? Um, I, I, I know that's a significant piece of, uh, of activity in a unique use case around CRs, um, but what other use cases have they been uh, in, at least considered? Absolutely. So RPA has been used to check um, federal contracts and vendors um, for exclusions and their relationship for, for, their, for the federal government. It's been used to help with the contract closeout administration process, modifying documents with appropriate contact information and contract information and sent to key stakeholders such as vendors and the core. And we have also um, used RPA in, to reduce the fraud and abuse that my colleague Miguel is actually going to talk about in a couple of, couple of presentations from now. Thank you. Absolutely. Hi. This is Polly, great Hi. presentation. Thank you both. Um, the question I had was uh, just to ask a little bit about how the data for the automation is prepared. You had mentioned Excel sheets and Word documents. Is that um, CO created? Excel sheets, et cetera, or is that pulled directly from systems in preparation for the automation? Great question, Polly. So the contracting officers um, receive the emailed budget analysis sheets, and then they create a modification document on their own. So what they're doing is they're taking those emailed spreadsheets um, from those overseas contractors and then um, attaching their old modification document and putting it into a, a shared folder so the bot can grab those documents and um, capture that data. Yeah, but for other modification use cases, we would pull from systems. It just depends on what type of modification we're doing. I, hi, I have a, I have a question. Um, I, <clears throat> this is a, to, um, I guess, William's uh, question, I definitely see a lot of use cases for this, and we do have uh, technical solutions that allow for mass modification. Um, one of, the, I mean, this is a very relevant thing as we look at doing the mass uh, changes to, um, uh, to accommodate for the COVID-19 um, mass changes. So my question to you is um, how, like, would we be able to go in and just add it on our own, um, i.e. like the systems folks to add, like do a, do a mass change or does the requirement have to come from somewhere else? So I guess this kind of gets to the data. So to clarify, are you asking um, how they would use UiPath to create the RPA automation? Yeah, how, so for example, like we have some FAR clauses that are hopefully coming pretty quickly that have to be implemented. Um, so we're having a lot of issues on the system side with, res with respect to how those are actually processed, right? So we need to change like contracts all the way across the board. So how, like, could we just um, go in and, you know, say, okay, this is the new FAR language that we want to be included. And, and then we implement that across the entire, um, for example, like HHS, or is it something, would individual folks have to do it? You absolutely can and do it across all of HHS. So as long as it knows which, which systems or applications it needs to access and what language needs to be updated, um, it's RPA is rule-based. Um, and, and data-driven, so it can absolutely handle it either, either on a pilot program with a few individuals or across the board. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, I wanted to ask in terms of the level of effort for the prep process. I know an earlier question was asked in terms of um, with the Excel documentation, uh, where that originated from, and um, how it was pulled. And the answer I believe was that the CO's shop would prepare those documentation, prepare that documentation and um, create shared folders. So we know that we're saying it streamlines and goes from 30 minutes to three minutes on the processing speed. What is the estimated time that would take a procurement shop to prepare all the data so that this tool could be utilized effectively? 
At this stage, it's about five minutes because those emails come in that the personal service contractors um, send to the contracting officers. And then they just place those folders into a predefined um, shared folder. So it's a matter of minutes. Uh, the 30 minutes of processing time was taking those Excel documents, switching between the two, looking at the past modification document, modifying the tables that we saw in the video, and then placing all of that new data into an entirely new um, modification document. Right, but to implement this across an agency I mean, where I mean, they have Time is up. And uh, again, I want to just kind of remind folks that this is a time to question for the judges to question, not the audience. Okay, that time will come later. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. All right, guys. So this is where we're going to take a 15 minute break. Okay. Um, I will, I would say, let's, let's say 10, come back 10, 10 05. Okay. Make it 14 minute break. I don't want to be a, a high C and make it to exact minute. So, um, so we will we, we will come back again in fifteen minutes. Okay, thank you. Our, our contestant, our um, our next uh, group um, is from Oracle. Um, can I, I did a roll call earlier. Do we have representation for blockchain and AIML enabled government acquisition solutions and FedRAMP certified government cloud? That's a mouthful. Yep, yes. we have several people here for that. Awesome. Okay, so tee up your, your, um, your presentation and when you begin speaking, I will turn on the clock, all right? Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, I'd uh, like to uh, thank everyone for inviting us uh, to give this presentation today. Uh, my name's Tom Plunkett, and I'm joined today by Serge. Serge, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, everyone. My name is Serge Fionkiv. So we're here to talk about Oracle Blockchain and Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Enabled Government Act acquisition solution in a FedRAMP certified government cloud. That's quite a mouthful, as you mentioned. Um, you know, we're from Oracle. Our mission is to help people see data in new ways, discover insights, unlock endless possibilities. Oracle's very first customer was the federal government, and Oracle has continued to work closely with the federal government for the last 40 years. Um, and, however, we're not selling the same products we sold 40 years ago. Um, we've obviously evolved over the last 40 years, just as the, the problems and mission that the federal government has has evolved over the last 40 years. Here's a look at a modern acquisition solutions platform um, leveraging cloud and on-premise capabilities. And importantly to our suggestion, we're including blockchain and machine learning in this platform. So, for example, we've got backend applications, we've got uh, your traditional database for storing information, although obviously today's databases are far more capable than the ones in the past because they're leveraging machine learning inside them, um, as well as external uh, uh, machine learning and anomaly detection com components and a blockchain component for security and transparent sharing of information. Um, as well as all the usual integration capabilities. Um, and all of that is a platform behind the user-facing procurement lifecycle applications. Um, so, and of course, um, you know, we're heading into this area where we've got um, new capabilities for developing code rapidly, either, you know, sometimes referred to as low code or no code development, which Serge is gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, but really makes it easy to build an application rapidly. Um, I'll, I'll give an example a little later, but we took a blockchain uh, enabled system into production in HHS in under four months. Um, and so you can really build an enterprise class system doing important missions for the federal government really quickly using modern technology. So here's a look at some of the business challenges that blockchain can help you solve. Um, and many of these are applicable to current procurement systems that the federal government agencies are running. You know, first of all, um, there's a lot of siloed data systems um, in the federal government and in, in business in general. There's a lot of siloed business systems out there. Um, and where people say they have a single source of truth, but really they have a source of truth for their siloed data system, which is in co 
conflict with the source of truth that the other systems believe in. Um, and so that's a problem of trying to reconcile what is the actual truth. Um, and so there's a lot, uh, that's a big problem for enterprises today, especially government agencies. Uh, there's also a risk of, you know, in, in our current systems, you, you, you hear about human errors, fraud all the time, um, you know, it makes it very difficult to have audit trails and traceability and have transparent visibility. And blockchain is a great solution for solving those problems because you get this transparent ledger that everyone can have a view on. So now you have a true single source of truth with blockchain. It's a source of truth that everyone will accept. Whereas in traditional legacy systems, you just have their truth. Uh, furthermore, this is highly secure. Uh, there's better security with blockchain than we've ever had before in traditional IT security. Um, and so we'll talk about that as well, uh, as well as traceability. So how does blockchain help add some unique value uh, to uh, procurement stuff? Well, we say that blockchain gives you immutability or tamper evident data. If a hacker attempts to make a change to a blockchain system, it'll, easy, it'll be immediately obvious that a hacker has attempted that. Uh, whereas if a hacker uh, attempts to make a change to a siloed system, it may be weeks or months before you realize that there's been a hack. Um, the, everything is secured by digital signatures, uh, enhances trust in your, in your source of truth, um, and gives you this transparent access to information, uh, as well as the fact that you can control confidentiality and privacy and so forth. Um, so some of the main reasons why government agencies and other enterprises are looking at blockchain includes confidentiality, integrity of identity and data information, and this immutability and tamper proofing idea that I mentioned before, that you can see any uh, att attempt to modify the data, whether it was from a hacker or from an inadvertent error. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is a FedRAMP uh, cloud. Um, so, you know, we're using Oracle Cloud, so it's FedRAMP and certified. Uh, and you get all the benefits of all the various certifications that Oracle Cloud has gone through. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Oracle blockchain platform before we dive into how we're doing using it for procurement. Um, basically, the idea is Oracle blockchain platform is based on an open source project called Hyperledger Fabric. And we've taken the approach of increasing that open source project to make it more suitable for enterprises like the federal government. Um, so we've reduced the complexity of using Hyperledger Fabric and integrating it with other business systems to get access to all the information you need and to make it easy to rapidly integrate all sorts of different applications into your blockchain environment. So Serge, you want to talk about how we can do this from a development perspective? Absolutely, yes. And the creating a smart contract shouldn't be hard. Uh, we're trying to make it as easy as possible and uh, offer like a very easy entry point uh, for the developers. Uh, before that, uh, if you're kind of dealing with actual Hyperledger fabric, you have to write a lot of code uh, for your smart contract. We're trying to uh, kind of steer away from that. And we're offering a simple way to create a specification file uh, that you can upload uh, into the visual code builder extension uh, for the blockchain app builder. And uh, based on the specification, uh, visual code uh, extension will generate for you a smart contract project and all codes. What, what you have to do is just simply fill out your custom methods and the implementations. And then you can actually, without uh, kind of deploying it to the remote server, you can test it locally. So uh, we offer an integration with the Docker containers where you can provision a uh, local version of Hyperledger Fabric. And you can validate your contract. You can test it. You can make sure that everything is working uh, as it's supposed to. And then you can package and deploy your smart contract directly to the uh, Oracle blockchain platform. And the tool itself is very intuitive. And if uh, your developers are familiar with Visual Builder co Code, it's kind of very easy to use platform itself. And we adding a lot of UI elements, for example, on, on the right side, uh, we're exposing all those methods, um, all those APIs that's uh, available in smart contracts so developers can easily test uh, the capabilities of the smart contract and make sure that everything is working as supposed to. Back to you, Tom. All right, thanks, Serge. 
So um, just to give you an example of another place, we were rapidly able to take a blockchain project into production. Uh, we recently did a COVID-19 project for HHS. Um, we demoed the initial uh, idea to HHS uh, last September, about a year ago. And within four months, by January, we were in production. Uh, this system has been in uh, production with conditional ATO. We're working on the full ATO. And we're in the process, we've processed over 4 million COVID-19 test results um, with, you know, all this information being secured by the blockchain, shared between, you know, various labs and government agencies. Um, and uh, we've actually done some other presentations on this project for act -IAC in the past, so I'm not going to repeat this, but if anyone's interested in finding out more about this, feel free to reach out to us. Um, so we mentioned earlier, we're using both blockchain and AIML. Oracle has a long history of working with artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, in particular, Oracle worked with the U.S. Department of Energy in the 1990s to create one of the first uh, really significant uh, machine learning innovations, uh, referred to as MSET or multivariate state estimation technique. It's currently in use at all of the nuclear facilities in the U.S., uh, primarily to uh, prevent the possibility of a Chernobyl or third uh, Three Mile Island from occurring again. Uh, it's basically uh, machine learning for identifying when things are going wrong. Works great for identifying anomalies in systems. It can also be used in procurement for identifying anomalies, uh, for example, for, uh, that are a result of fraud or an incorrect application of the accounting rules. If you think about how the normal uh, fraud detection works in accounting, um, normally what they look for is for a flag. Like let's say um, this particular line item, if it goes over $100,000, you flag it. Some, some dollar amount that um, will trigger a flag. Well, what we do with machine learning is very different. We look at the pattern of behavior, we train the model. And then if we see things going wrong, even though they don't pass a a red flag like the $100,000 I mentioned, but if we see consistently people going right up to that flag, like 98,000 all the time, that might be a pattern of bad behavior. Um, and so we're using advanced machine learning to help identify where you should be doing auditing and looking for fraud in procurement. Um, Here's an example of how it does that. Um, it's, it's essentially another cloud service. Uh, everything we're talking about can be done in the cloud as services that you configure together. So, um, and it's referred to as uh, anomaly detection. Uh, and we, it's heavily patented. Uh, so there's a lot of potential benefits for this uh, blockchain and AIML uh, acquisition solution. Blockchain gives you the security capabilities, the immutability, tamper-proof, uh, integrity up. of data. Time's up, guys. Sorry. Okay. So that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, we use some of the act I act, and you can learn more about it. We really appreciate uh, being invited. Okay. We're opening up for judges to ask questions. A reminder, judges only, um, not from the audience at this time. So judges, if you've got questions for our presenters, please open up. Yes. Let me just jump in quickly. Hi, Tom. Hi, Serge. Thanks so much for that presentation. Um, can you explain the process if, if most acquisition offices have a contract writing system? And so the how, how you envision um, incorporating this, um, this solution with that already pre-existing um, contract writing system in order to make you know, the lives and the processes more efficient? Right, so we're really looking at this as sort of being a backend system, kind of like, you know, in a way, you know, people think about the database as being the backend, but we're expanding the debt backend of the platform to have your blockchain on the backend. So here is your traditional procurement lifecycle application that the contracting officer works with. Um, but the blockchain system is, is in the back and it's ensuring that not only is your procurement system you're working with getting access to information, but that system is being kept in sync with all of the other systems that it has to interoperate with. So instead of having this sort of pipeline idea where you get some data and then you pass it on to the next person in line in the procurement and they get the data and then they work on it and they're the owner, instead everybody has access to the latest data. Uh, but it's all being handled on the back end. It won't change the front end that the uh, procurement people are working with. Yeah, so we are exposing a set of uh, services, uh, APIs, that basically can be consumed by any application and that will help uh, to ensure kind of execution of the smart contract. 
Right. And so my follow-up question to that is, is there, is there anything that folks will need to know or do with their contract writing system ahead of, in, in order to integrate with this? Uh, so, this is, go ahead, Serge. Uh, yeah, it's just a standard uh, REST APIs. Um, so I would assume that your developer team already familiar with that. It's kind of common um, development patterns that we see. And uh, it's very easy to use and consume. It's just a JSON payload. So it's a very easy to read um, data sets that you're sending in and out. And with the tool that I showed you guys, right, uh, that uh, app builder, smart uh, blockchain app builder, it's very easy to define um, the content of your payloads, right? Uh, so we're working right now with a couple of agencies uh, where we define a content of the smart contract. And it's just a matter of uh, declaring uh, those fields, mandatory fields or optional fields that you would like to fill in your application that you would like to preserve in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Hello folks, this is uh, William. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. I, I saw where you said that your anomaly detection is really a, a place where you have deployed this capability. Uh, is that the best use case that you have seen in government to point this solution towards? Is that a problem? Is that the best problem? Um, and the reason I ask is I've always thought that government could do a much better job of doing a risk-based approach to its policies, that you take the data in, in an acquisition environment, you analyze the data and see what the behaviors are, and then analyze the behaviors to inform your local or even, even at a higher level, your acquisition policies throughout the life cycle. Is that a, is that a use case that this anomaly detection or, or this type of strategy could be used for? So the way we're using this uh, machine learning environment is it, it, it does involve tr uh, a training model and training data. So if you have training data based on what users are doing under these policies, then you can train it to look for anomalies. So for example, uh, here, for example, we're just uh, monitoring a number of signals. Um, and, you know, if they even if they don't go up to the point where they uh, flag a threshold, we can identify when they're headed towards that direction uh, and things look to be going wrong. And for example, if a procurement process, the, the kind of uh, the sequence was broken uh, at some point and the uh, approval process didn't happen in the order that it used to happen, that's good raise a flag. That's your Jarvis for your uh, uh, Iron Man suit. Got it. Yeah. I, and, and I think we all realize when they're broken, it's like, where is the most optimized before it breaks? Could you use the data to identify the most optimized solution? So, so thank you for that. And, and yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do. You know, cause if you look over here, uh, it's this little diagram down here at the bottom, where it says threshold trip. That last one is where we've actually broken that threshold, right. but we've got these warning signs ahead of time and it's using those warning signs to say, Hey, this is going wrong. Don't wait till you hit the threshold. Thank you. Uh, that's time's up for questions. Uh, Oracle, I want to thank you for an incredible, um, <clears throat> incredible presentation. Um, next up on our list is, hold on. Um, the OTG, OTG group. Okay, of course, CLM, very good. Um, I will start the timer when you guys are ready to go. So thank you. We're, we're ready to go. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jay Schmatt. 